It is no accident Mark Knoll entitled his book The Old Religion in the New World as such, for he points out differences between the American church and its European counterpart. The chapter Thundering Legions in Nathan Hatch's The Democratization of Christianity does much the same, although Hatch focuses on the impact of democratic ideals. This brief video lecture intentionally zeroes in on the differences. For the most part, the differences are not doctrinal, although doctrinal differences emerge in the various American denominations. Prior to Engel v. Vitale, the court case which resulted in the Supreme Court stating schools could not require students to recite a stipulated prayer, the nation gave far less attention to issues of church and state than they do today. When the Supreme Court made its ruling, conservative Christians loudly protested. Subsequent rulings from the court took denominationally oriented religious education out of public schools. Since then, there has been an ongoing battle over the interpretation of the Constitution's First Amendment. I found the few are hard to understand, however, because I grew up in Iowa in the mid-20th century and none of the six schools I attended required a prayer and there was no religious education in the classrooms. The battle, however, continues to this day and can be seen in various circumstances. Although the Supreme Court rulings are often misunderstood, Frightened school administrators often take drastic measures to avoid any hint of religion in school life, and they are often inconsistent in their actions. For example, a Washington State high school football coach was forbidden to go to the 50-yard line after a game to pray, yet they permitted a Buddhist teacher to offer meditations. There was nothing in the Supreme Court rulings forbidding prayer in school. Schools could not write a prescribed prayer for students to recite. That was the thrust of the whole point. The Bible, however, may be taught as literature, but it cannot be given specific sectarian or denominational interpretations. Many American Christians believe that the country was and is a Christian nation. Such beliefs arise out of the mistaken understanding of the nation's beginnings. For example, many believe the Puritans came to America in search of religious freedom. Well, this is true to a point. Puritans came to North America in search of a place where they could freely create a community according to their specific beliefs. Puritans, however, were not willing to extend to others the same freedoms. Puritans told Quakers who entered the colony, you're free to worship God according to your beliefs, but just not here. It's also mistakenly believed there was never any, any kind of state church in America. This is absolutely false. Every colony but Rhode Island and Pennsylvania had a state church. Massachusetts named Congregationalism as its state church. New York and the Middle Colonies were all firmly Church of England. When the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution of 1787, the, the states began to disestablish or take away their state churches. Massachusetts was the last state to do so in 1833. You often hear that the United States was founded only on Christian principles. This too is a grievous error. While many of the founders were Christian, they were not all biblically oriented evangelical Christians. Some were deists, although to be honest, most of them were inconsistent in their deism. Thomas Jefferson, for example, compiled a personal Bible, eliminating all the miracles from its pages. Still others, such as John Adams and James Monroe, were solid believers in Christ, Adams a Congregationalist and Monroe an Anglican. The founders drew heavily from the following, the Enlightenment philosophes, the pages of the Old Testament, Roman law, and British common law. More on this is coming soon. Conservative Christian scholars often downplay the importance of the Enlightenment or Aufklärung as it was known in Europe. American Christianity, in my view, cannot be adequately understood without attention given to the philosophical developments of the 17th and 18th century. The Enlightenment offered a new way to look at the world. It brought about a new worldview. In some ways, the Enlightenment began with Copernicus and Galileo. Their discoveries revealed the Earth was not the center of the universe as taught in the Catholic Church. Instead, their view turned the world on its head and helped individuals realize, realize authority such as that found in the church or in government could possibly be wrong. 
I could introduce you to numerous Enlightenment scholars, men known as philosophes. Here are four outstanding philosophical leaders from the mid-17th century and the early 18th. John Locke, Montesquieu, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Voltaire. Their thinking shaped American political institutions as we know them today. Absolute rulers held power in Europe, and these rulers ruled absolutely. Each monarch ruled by divine right. That is, they believed God placed them in power, and their word was law. A tyrant might be overthrown, but another ruler replaced him or her. The Enlightenment philosophes, however, suggested alternatives to such authority. John Locke wrote a letter concerning toleration. In that letter, he argued for a more tolerant and benevolent government. After all, he said, God has given human beings certain rights, life, liberty, and property. Rulers who rule properly recognize this and rule by unseen compact as long as they protect life, liberty, and property. Such thinking derives from Romans 13. Paul says the role of government is to protect the good and punish the evildoer. When a government or ruler no longer acts properly, they can and should be replaced with rulers or government that will fulfill their proper role. Montesquieu or Montesquieu took this idea of contact, contract a bit further. He argued governments tend to accumulate power when ruled by one individual. He advocated a government in which there was a separation of powers into executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Jean-Jacques Rousseau looked to nature for answers to life's profound questions. He believed in the inherent goodness of man, which became twisted through negative experiences. He saw government as a social contract made with its citizens. When the government violates the contract, it should be replaced. Jefferson once remarked that every nation needs a good revolution once in a while. Voltaire, a rather bawdy and worldly man, is known for his novel Candide. At the heart of his thinking is the concept of the separation of church and state. The shift in thinking brought about by the Enlightenment produced dramatic results. Beginning with the scientific revolution, which began with a new way of thinking based on observation and a willingness to question assumptions. Locke insisted human beings are born with a blank slate, or tabula rasa, and education and experience add content to the mind. Knowledge is what one knows by experience. Experience is derived by the senses, taste, touch, hearing, smelling, or seeing. The emphasis on such sensory data is drawn from inductive thinking or inductive reasoning. The philosophers of the Enlightenment applied the scientific approach to society, and this in turn spurred on a new idea about government. As these ideas spread, they were discussed in public gatherings called salons in France. Ultimately, the middle class picked them up and began to push for reforms. From that push came two significant revolutions, the American Revolution of 1776 and the French Revolution of 1789. In brief, the contributions of the Enlightenment are reason, skepticism, religious tolerance, liberty, progress, and empiricism. The American religious and social context cannot be understood without an awareness of these contributions. The Enlightenment emphasized individual conscience, human ability to think and reason for oneself, the use of the inductive method which depended upon observation and experimentation, and the stress of intellect over feeling. Sadly, the Enlightenment also raised questions about the reality of the unseen world of the spirit. Since spiritual realities could not and cannot be weighed, measured, touched, seen, heard, smelled, or tasted, they cannot be known. Enlightenment philosophes sharply distinguished between that which was accepted by faith and that which could be empirically known. Francis A. Schaeffer, a well-known Presbyterian theologian from the last century, described a distinction between that which could be empirically known and that which was accepted by faith. He described a line drawn between nature and grace. Above the line is non-rational and non-logical faith. 
Below the line is the rational and logical. In other words, to, to illustrate that, I might say that above the line was simply uh, a kind of understanding that faith was simply believing what you know isn't true. But the non logical the non-rational faith depended upon a de definition as a sense of feeling or emotion, whereas the rational depended on the intellect to comprehend reality. Enlightenment thinkers agreed humans had the ability to reason, evaluate, and come to grips with reality. Differences were not to be shunned, but tolerated for our considering uh, such tolerance. For our consideration, such toleration was particularly true in the realm of religious faith. They might join a particular denomination and accept their creed, or they could form a personal set of beliefs or reject all of them. Individuals quite often formed their views, joined a denomination which held views close to theirs, or simply refused to express their beliefs. Numerous independent congregations now exist in the United States. Most of these congregations have a statement of faith, but they are usually generic and unspecific. In the early days of the Republic, there were few congregations not tied to a particular denomination or creed. Congregations aligned with the Restoration Movement, which began in the early 1800s, were among the first to offer believers the opportunity to unite with others on the basis of a simple profession of faith. These churches, did not require adherence to a specific confession, creed, or book other than the Bible. Believers were simply asked to state their conviction about Jesus and his relationship to God. The other differences that we can see are illustrated on the table, and they can be broken down into several components. Let's take each one of these in turn, and I'll try to draw a contrast between what is true in the Europe and what is true in the United States. In the area of leadership, European churches depend upon hierarchical leadership. That was the predominant form in Europe. In England, the monarch appointed the archbishops and bishops who led the Church of England. Various monarchs on the continent appointed leaders for the Reformed and Lutheran churches. As Gary Wills put it, it had been assumed that a national throne and a national altar must be in alliance. Churches and national rulers or ruling bodies ruled with total agreement. With the passing of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the United States rid itself of both throne and altar in one full sweep. Church leadership structures in America became intensely democratic. This change began before the new nation ever came into existence. Separated by 3,000 miles of ocean, it was very difficult for European leaders to maintain control. For example, the Archbishop of Canterbury, or in some cases the Archbishop of Lincoln, had little authority in American Anglican churches. Anglican congregations set up vestries, or church boards, <clears throat> to govern local congregations. Churches in Massachusetts operated even more democratically as they enjoyed a congregational form of local government. Lutherans and Presbyterians were led by local pastors who joined together to form presbyteries or structures that, in which they discussed issues and came to solutions or sessions in the local church and then synods, which was made up of members from the presbyteries of a region. In the issue of religion, in Europe, Christian identity was determined by the state church. At birth, an individual was added to the roles of the state church. In some cases, it became confusing. Henry VIII wrestled control from the English church from the Pope, and his young son Edward kept it as a Protestant church. When Mary Tudor became queen, she returned England to papal authority. If you lived during Mary's reign, you were Catholic. When Mary's half-sister, Elizabeth, came to the throne, she once again separated the English church from, the, from Catholicism. Under Elizabeth's rule, the English church was Protestant, and those who were born in England were Protestant. In Europe today, the state determines your religion. In many nations, the state may permit tolerance, but as a citizen, you are considered a part of the state religion. Your belief or practice means little. You are what you are. 
In the United States, each individual chooses whether or not to be a Christian, and the choice of your religious identity belongs to you. You can choose not to choose if you wish. Today, more and more people are identifying themselves as nuns or duns, and they have no religious identity. They may claim to be Christian, but they're not part of a congregation. There are also a number of differences that need to be discussed. Acceptance of dissident groups in Europe moved from overt persecution and oppression to uneasy toleration beginning in the mid-1600s. Catholics set the stage for the Inquisition in an attempt to stamp out nonconformist groups. The French extended toleration to the Huguenots, or French Protestants, when it suited them, and withdrew it when they insisted on the principle of one king, one religion. The fact is, in Europe, what the crown gives, the crown can take away. Conformity was expected in the American religious, religious colonies, too. Only in Rhode Island and Pennsylvania was there freedom of religion. Lord Baltimore, or George Calvert, originally permitted religious freedom in Maryland, but Protestants overwhelmed the, the original Catholic colonists. With Protestants in control in Maryland, they soon restricted the freedom of religion and the free exercise of an individual faith. <clears throat> it took time, but England's act of toleration became the law of the land in England and in America. Toleration, however, is not freedom. A state which allows toleration may order toleration, but it can also take it away. Americans understood freedom was a natural right, a right given by a loving creator. The Enlightenment contributed the idea that individuals had the ability and, and a certain inalienable right to make a choice. Freedom to choose, to believe or not believe, was a right given by God, although not expressly stated, which came from the others that were given. Participation in churches were co coerced in Europe, Nowhere was this more clear than in Switzerland during the time of John Calvin and his Reformation. Swiss magistrates required by law church attendance, and other states did too. But this was normal in Europe. Whatever the state church was, the state required attendance, participation, and took a tithe. When the United States gained its independence, worship particip participation was voluntary. Church attendance was at a low ebb, and was about 7% or less of the population in 1800. Martin Marty described the period immediately after the Revolutionary War as the Big Sleep. Except in those states which still had established churches, membership was voluntary but often required the reporting of an experience to affirm God's election and the vote of church leadership or, member, or church members who judged the experience valid or invalid. A variety of denominations with differing beliefs, organizational structures, rituals, and leadership offered Americans choices. There were also, <clears throat> uh, with the passing of the First Amendment, competition for members, and it was dramatic, and there were numerous charges of sheep stealing from various preachers who were concerned that one church or denomination was stealing from another. And uh, this, this was probably true, as individuals moved from Baptist to Presbyterian to Anglican to Methodist or whatever. As far as commitment to Christ is concerned, commitment to Christ by individual members was often nominal in Europe, regardless of the approved church and approved ritual. They were Reformed or Lutheran or Catholic or Anglican not because they necessarily believed anything about the church or its doctrine, but because it was who they were and it was required. In America, freedom to choose does not overcome the issue of nominalism. The revivals of the early 1800s stimulated conviction and commitment, but f religious fires, emotional fires die down, and the excitement ultimately goes away. As far as identity, personal identity, and religious identity is concerned, in Europe, as we've already indicated, One's identity, as far as state and church are concerned, are, is defined by the king, the state, and the state church. Not so in the United States, but while there was no state church, the de facto state religion was Protestant Christianity. 
Protestantism did not find itself in a majority because of state support, but because the majority of Christian Americans identified with Protestant values and beliefs. In other words, nothing was required and no Protestant denomination in itself had a majority of the American population at that time as its members. But overall, those people who were part of the American culture identified with Protestant values and beliefs. Catholicism was suspect because of the religious, of the religious wars in Europe. The English remembered the rule of Bloody Mary, Mary Tudor, as she attempted to replace England as a papal fiefdom. Mary ordered the execution of hundreds of Protestant leaders during her brief reign. It was during that period that Fox's Book of Martyrs was written. It is often said the United States is a Christian nation, but that's just not true. The First Amendment forbids the federal government from naming Christianity as a state church, or any religion as a state church or belief. The United States was a Christian nation only to the extent <coughs> the United States was a Christian nation only to the extent its people were Christians and lived by Christian teaching and values. The Protestant majority exerted tremendous influence in daily life. At the same time, the national government refused to take sides in religious disputes. It did not involve itself in matters involving the Shakers, for example, or the Fouillet Society, or Brook Farm, or spiritualism, or the variety of weird communal societies that came into existence between 1800 and 1850. They simply took a hands-off position. They refused to get involved in any of these issues. As far as rights are concerned, Europe Europeans believed all rights, including religious rights, derived from the state. The Declaration of Independence in the United States, however, said rights derived from the Creator. Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, exhibited a lack of specificity regarding the Creator, a result of his deist beliefs. Instead, the previous paragraph in the Declaration speaks of the laws of nature and of nature's God. There were those among the founders who understood the importance of a nation in which Christian values predominated, though. John Adams, a committed Christian, wrote, We have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So the question arises again. Is the United States a Christian nation? And the answer is yes, I guess, if you consider the Founding Fathers and the belief of the national population. America was Christian, however, because its people were at least acquainted with Christian, and I might say Protestant, values. But technically, it isn't, because the nation has no state church or officially, officially recognized religion in the United States, all religions are appropriate. All religions can practice their faith. All beliefs can share part of the national picture. America can be a Christian nation, however, if Christ's followers will once again take seriously the Great Commission. Only when a large majority live Christ-centered lives will America reflect Christian values and once again be considered a Christian nation.